Right, everybody, let's get started. So, welcome to uh, CS 151 ECE 116. If it's a different class, now it's time to go, or you just you can hang around. Uh, so, I'm very excited to have you all guys here. And uh, looking forward to have a great quarter together. Uh, this is a very large class, so we should hopefully help each other out to have a best experience. Uh, so the plan for today is I'm going to uh, give you a little bit of introduction. First, I'm going to talk about you know the logistics at Mysterivia. Uh, I know if many of you ask questions about discussion sessions. Uh, about PTEs and stuff like that. When is the quiz? When is the date? And so on. So I'm going to answer all those questions, and then feel free to ask more questions uh, while I'm doing. Uh, you know, while I'm explaining these, so we can later to discuss as well. Uh, and then in the later half of this class today, I'm going to start with like some basic concepts. Hopefully, we have time and we can go over that. Okay. Uh, so before getting into the logistics, uh, quick overview about myself. Um, my name is Nader. Uh, I joined UCLA in 2020, and this is the fourth time that I'm teaching this course. Uh, it's one of my favorite courses that I teach here uh, because it's usually the time that I get to know lots of new people. Um, my general research interest is in computer architecture, more on the security side. So I'm more focusing on how do we build and design architectures that are secure. Um, and I also do a lot of work on IoT level security and privacy. Uh, uh, before UCLA, I was at Georgia Tech and I did my PhD there in computer science. Uh, my bachelor was in EE, electrical engineering, but my CS, uh, my PhD was in CS. So I kind of like have background in both. Um, uh, if you're doing, if you're interested in doing research in these topics, you can throughout the course or later on at the end, you can always reach out to me and we can discuss. Uh, I'm also going to teach uh, a couple of security related course next quarter and the quarter after, which I'm going to talk about at the end of this course. Uh, I have two cats, which probably already know. Uh, this is my wife and me. Uh, so I'm originally from Iran, and this is like our Persian New Year, which is usually in March. Uh, so you're going to see a lot of cat photos in my in my lectures, as you have already seen. Uh, uh, the, the right one is called PJ, uh, Pina Jr., and the left one is called Meadow, and my wife is Ellie. Uh, so the big question here is, how do you pronounce my name? Uh, so my first name is Nader, and the A is kind of long. Uh, my last name is Sehat Baksh, uh, and we can kind of divide it into three pieces, Sehat Baksh. Uh, the last part is definitely difficult. To make your life easier, you can just call me by my first name, Nader. Uh, that's totally fine. Uh, if you want to be more kind of formal, uh, you can either call me Professor or Professor Sehad. You don't need to pronounce the second part if you don't want to. Uh, uh, the part that I don't like is just mixing and matching these two together, like Professor Nader, which is neither formal nor informal. So uh, just, just, just you know, if you want to be informal, just go all the way, right? So. Uh, that's that's my request. Uh, most people don't follow it, but please. <laughs> All right. Uh, the best way to contact me from now on is DM me on Campusfire. I'm going to talk about what is Campusfire for those of you who don't know. Uh, but the best way to, if you have any questions about the course, just message me on Campusfire. Okay. Uh, if you want to, if you have any questions about, like, if you want to have an appointment, any any questions you have about the course, if you want to email me, you can email me at this address here. If it's more of serious questions or something is more 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 elaborate, uh, I usually responsive on both of them. Uh, but since there are many of you, it might take a little bit of time for me to answer those. Uh, my office hours are on Thursdays at four to five in person. My office is in Boulder Hall, just across the Court of Sciences in sixth floor, 6731 and letter G. Uh, if that time doesn't work for you guys, you can always like message me and we can schedule something. I usually free Friday afternoon as well in person. Uh, after the class is also a good time for, for chatting, uh, especially on, on Tuesdays. Uh, 
But if none of these times work or there's something that you feel like you need more time to discuss and so on, uh, send me a message on CampusWire and we can schedule something either on Zoom or on in person, whichever you prefer. Okay. Uh, so before jumping into the rest, I'm also curious to know well, how was your summer going? We had very productive summer, both me and PJ. Uh, but I was curious that what did you guys do? Uh, so I don't know, any volunteers, anything interesting to share? I'm going to actually give uh, bonus points to the most interesting idea, you know, most interesting thing that you did in summer. Anyone said, yeah. I didn't participate and I made my CEO quit the company. Hey, <laughs> quit the company. CEO quit the company. Okay. <laughs> While you were doing it or while I'm doing it? Oh, okay. So four what, weeks in it. What did, what, what did you do? I started working with a professor on campus. Oh, okay. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah. I went to India. Went to India? Yes. Anything interesting happened? I went with him. Okay. Uh, I went to Japan, and then as we were climbing up the shrine, we played the Rocky theme song, and then when we got to the top of the hill, we were like, <laughs> How far was the It was like a 30 minute, like, walk, like, run up. Okay. I was in the same area. Uh-huh. I got two points. Oh, you got two points. Anything, yeah. What did you have? People or? I think my relatives are both the best. Oh, okay. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Um, I have money for the building in front of the office. Say that. I have money for the building in front of the office. That's interesting. Where was the first one was? Um, in the hotel for the access to the South and Ecuador. Oh, wow. <laughs> Anything else? I like to put some things. Good job, Dave. I like to put some things. Good job, Dave. It was like a lot of flip, a weird private. Uh huh. I don't know, but it's weird. How far was it? Um, I think it was like 10. Okay. Anything else? Maybe one, one or two more. Vincent. Uh, I went to Vegas and practiced bar. Oh, okay. Uh, Which part was it? Oh, was it part of the uh, the hackathon or? Yeah, the hackathon. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't really do much. I just turned what is like green to red, and but the car was not in Vegas. It was in Detroit, so I thought it was green. Oh gosh. Uh, went to the Yellowstone National Park. Uh huh. So, saw like bison. And just, oh, okay. okay. And, like it was the bison like riding like riding something. Yeah, I really love the video, but that's why. Mm -hmm. One, two more. Yeah. Uh, I went kayaking here to the cave. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. How long? Wait, how long ago? I'm not sure, but I went to the cave. Hold on. Um, we went to Coney Island at midnight in New York, and there was some like random found where there was a ping pong. I don't know. Does any of these worthy of the bonus points? Anybody? I was looking for something more crazier, but uh, let me think about it. I'll 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 uh I'll make a decision. All right. Any final thing anyone wants to share? You good. Cool. Uh, so hope I yeah, generally hope you all had a very good uh um uh, summer. How many of you did an internship? Just raise your hands. Well, almost everybody. How many of you did an internship in a fan company and Mark or and or Microsoft? You know what Fang is, right? Facebook, Apple. Amazon. Okay, few. All right. How many of you stay here and did research? How many of you just chill? That's good. All right. All right. Uh, anyway, so welcome back. You know, beginning of the fall, it's both exciting and very sad because you know the summer is ending. But uh, but I think it's 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 an interesting. It's going to be a very interesting quarter. I'm hoping. All right, so we're going to have three TAs, Justin, Puya, and Fatima. Uh, Justin has been TA for this course before, so he's pretty senior. Uh, Puya and Fatima are new, uh, but both of them are very, very knowledgeable. Uh, Puya has been working in AMD for a couple of years, so you can actually talk to him about 
industry experience in computer architecture. And Fatima is coming from fresh from from bachelor, so we can talk to her about what is what is, does it like feel to to be a PhD student. Uh, same as me, it's the best way to contact them is through CampusWire. So just DM them directly in CampusWire if you have any questions from them. Uh, there won't be any discussion sessions this week. Uh, the first one going to be next week. I'm going to actually discuss what's what how the discussion session going to be run, but there won't be any discussion session today, tomorrow, any of that. Okay. Uh, one thing I wanted to do, you guys to do is uh, probably those of you already in CampusWire, go to the link here or the link I posted on CampusWire. Go to Padlet. It's this other website that you can introduce yourself. Uh, it's useful for all of us to kind of get to know each other. So please do that if you have time. All right. Uh, it's optional, but I mean, if you do it, it would be nice. Um, so lecture format. So all the lectures would be in person, but I'm going to, uh, I'm going to record everything and I'm going to post it on the same day, usually, uh, after the class, uh, I'll post it on YouTube and then put the link on the website. Um, uh, and uh, you are not allowed to join Zoom. So I'm gonna use Zoom to record, but you're not allowed to join the Zoom uh, remotely, okay? The reason for this is just, it's, it's a hassle in terms of logistics, okay? So if you want to be in person, just come to the class. If you want to just w watch the video, just watch the video. You don't need to do both, okay? Uh, so attendance is generally encouraged, but not required. Uh, the only thing that is required is for the quizzes. I'm gonna describe the, the quizzes in the next few slides. Uh, of course, if COVID related things happens, we need to follow the guidelines. Uh, so just be careful, especially at the beginning of the quarter, not to get COVID. Um, the slides would be, so all the PDF, uh, there are some seats in the, in the, in the, in the front if you want to. Uh, so all the slides are usually posted a day before or in the morning of the class. Um, and to find the, the, the slides, you have to go to this uh, website. Uh, generally, this is uh, everything will be posted here, both the videos and the slides. Uh, if you want to see last year material, all you need to do is basically changing this uh, F23 to F22 or F21, and you will see last year or the previous year material, uh, both the slides and the videos. Uh, I'm not going to share the notes that I'm writing during the lecture. The reason for this is I want you guys to, to, to write and be more interactive during the lecture. Uh, and also sometimes I found that people rely on my notes, but the notes are not the best. Uh, so they're kind of disappointed. Uh, so please just write your own notes uh, or ask for other friends who write good notes and ask them to, to share it with you. But I'm not gonna share my notes with you, okay? And that's the reason for it, all right? Uh, so campus wire. So the link for the campus wire is posted on Bruin Learn on Canvas. We're not going to use Canvas in this course. We're going to use campus wire. How many of you never used campus wire before? Okay, a few of you. So campus wire is like Piazza and nicer version. Uh, uh, we're going to use it for announcement, for for Q and A, uh, for for messaging and stuff like that. Uh, I post a link to uh, to Brunlin, as I said, there's a join code there as well. Use that to to enroll. I, I think I saw around like 100 something, uh, just a minute, uh, 100 something uh, enrollment already. Yeah, question. Yeah, so the question is the code is not working. I, I think there is some form of problem with like the browser. It's some form of cache browser issue because Try in incognito mode or, or, or self mode first. If that doesn't work, you can actually go inside CampusWire and search for the course and then use the join code. If none of these work, then uh, just email me and uh, I'll manually add. You, you have the same question? Yeah. If you go through the link and ask if that will work, because then the link like on the normal Bitcoin page is dead. Oh, really? Okay. So, the, so the, the comment was if you go to the announcement and then click on the link, it will work. There's also a link that I posted on the home page that apparently that doesn't work. I'll change I'll make sure to, to, to maybe modify that. Anything else? I by the way, I'm gonna repeat the questions because it won't be catched. I uh, mean it won't be caught by by the microphone. So for those who are watching this online, I'm uh, just repeating the questions. Okay. 
Uh, all right. So the main use case of, of Campus Wire will be for, for you to ask questions, but not just asking you also, I, I highly encourage you to answer each other's questions, okay? Don't be afraid of asking questions and don't be afraid of answering questions. Uh, everything, first of all, is anonymized. Even I don't know who answered and who said what, okay? But please just keep it clean and, you know, professional. Uh, 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 and uh, me and the TAs will regularly check the website and kind of try to answer it. But we typically wait a little bit for you guys to answer each other's questions before we jump in and kind of, uh, you know, answering. So we're typically going to see that we kind of endorse answers uh, rather than me answering the questions. But if you see something wrong or if there is more things needs to be added and so on, we're going to, you know, add it to the, to the comments. Okay. So be completely kind of like, you know, be free, be, be encouraged to, to kind of ask questions. Uh, Campus where typically is the, is the main source for people to kind of learn lots of things. Uh, in this class, we, we have usually more than thousands of posts last, last year. And this year, the class is even bigger, so I'm, I'm expecting to see a lot of posts. Uh, one thing that I request is try to see if the question is already being asked or answered before you know posting a new question, uh, because that makes it a little bit com confusing for other people. Uh, but other than that, just feel free to ask questions. Also, if you see something interesting, relevant to the course, you can post it. That's that's also totally fine. Okay. So we're gonna actually great participation in this class and being active in in campus wide will give you points. I'm gonna discuss that later. And also we're gonna have bonus points. So if you're really really active, then uh then you get bonus points in in campus wide. A few of people like five to ten people are gonna get to the bonus points. All right. Uh, so the exams, uh, there are going to be three quizzes in this class. Uh, we won't have like a regular midterm and final. Uh, what we're going to have is three quizzes. Uh, the quiz is going to be in person here uh, during the normal lecture hours, uh, usually one to what, one and a half hour. Uh, I'm going to post the samples of last year's uh, later on in the class. Actually, again, if you go back to last year uh, materials, you will find them. Uh, the date's going to be these three. It's going to be October 31st, uh, uh, ironically, on, uh, on, on, on uh, Halloween day. It's going to be Tuesday of week five. Then we're going to have the Tuesday of 21st. Uh, this is Thanksgiving week, unfortunately, because we kind of usually, we, I try to avoid the Thanksgiving weekend. Uh, but unfortunately, there's not much we can do here. Uh, and then the last one would be the last day of class, okay? And then there will be any final. Uh, if you cannot attend any of these, uh, please email me uh, or message me on CampusWire. I, I, in some special circumstances, I'm going to allow you to attend over Zoom, okay? So at the same time, but over Zoom, you can attend the exam uh, in case that you have something emergency or family related and so on and so forth, okay? But you have to tell me beforehand. Right? You, you cannot assume that by default, you can just join the Zoom. Okay. Uh, homeworks, we're going to have uh, roughly between three to five. If you have time, maybe six. Uh, these homeworks usually very short. Uh, this is more for you to kind of practice. Uh, uh, we might have some mini programming assignments within the lecture, uh, within the homeworks too. Uh, we're not going to uh, grade this based on accuracy. We're going to just grade this based on completeness. Okay. So just make sure that you write things in different questions. Uh, usually we're gonna have a week for, for the homework to, to be turned in. So we're gonna post it usually on Fridays. And then we're gonna ask you to kind of like post it, like, you know, submit your answers by the next Friday. Everything will be through Gradescope. People are already enrolled on Gradescope. So you should be auto enrolled. If you're not, again, message me on CampusWire and I'll, mm -hmm. I'll enroll you on uh, on, on, on Gradescope. Those of you who are not enrolled already or recently enrolled might not be on, on Gradescope. So I'm gonna actually add you on Gradescope, okay? Uh, again, last year's homework going to be available as well on the website. We're gonna have probably two more like serious programming assignments in this course. Uh, the language we're gonna use is C and C++. But if you want to use other languages, you're free to do. We're gonna provide a template for C++ version. 
but you are free to kind of like use whatever language you want to use and start from scratch, okay? Uh, the project will be based on designing a processor. So we're gonna actually, in this course, we're gonna talk about how do we design a processor, what are the components and so on. The project will be implementing that in C, kind of like designing a simulator, okay? Uh, the first one would be like a basic simulator. The second one would be like adding some advanced feature into the simulator, all right? Uh, again, everything will be posted on Grayscope. You have to submit it on Grayscope, it will be auto-graded on Grayscope. So will be, we will post some test cases and you have to pass those test cases basically in order to make sure that you get full grade. Um, late submissions usually won't be allowed, not for neither for homeworks or the projects. Again, unless there is like a very, very special circumstance, okay? Otherwise, there won't be any sort of like, oh, I get like 20% penalty and I can submit, okay? Uh, but I tend to kind of extend projects if there is like a special circumstances. So if you really, really need that, I mean, message me and we can figure something out, okay? For those of you who are in the honors section, I'm going to actually discuss what we're going to do for the project. So that's the part that's a little bit different. Uh, grading. That's the most important part of this course. Uh, we're going to have basically four different components as I described. Uh, the project is going to be the 30% of your class uh, grading. Uh, the, uh, the quizzes will be 55%, three quizzes. And then there will be 10% for the homeworks. And there's going to be 5% for the participation. I'm going to describe how the participation will work. You can either attend the class and that will count as participation or you can be active on campus wire and that will count as your participation, either or, okay? And then I'm gonna give you some bonuses uh, along the way to kind of help you to kind of, if you you know miss something or if you didn't do well on the quiz or so on, uh, there will be bonuses. So usually for the second project, we will have a bonus component. Uh, for participation, you're gonna get bonus components. If you have interesting story to share, you're gonna get bonus components, right? So these are the ways that you can kind of like uh, make sure that you're you're in good shape. Uh, so the grading policy is that we're gonna drop one homework, no question asked, okay? You have to submit, but then we're gonna drop it. So you cannot like skip homeworks uh, unless there's something happens and then we can then uh, you know uh, accept that as your drop. But your lowest grade for homework will be dropped. We're not going to ask you why and so on. We're not going to do the same for quizzes. So all the three quizzes will count, OK? But what we might do is if you see a significant improvement from one quiz to other, or if you see an anomaly, like you did very well in two quizzes and then terrible on the other quiz, we're going to do some form of weighting. So for example, instead of doing 30, 30, 33, 33, 33, we're going to do like 40, I don't know. 30 something, right? So 40, 30, 30. Maybe like your highest scores would be a little bit high, okay? I'm gonna post that policy later in the, in the class. Uh, and that depends on the distribution of the quizzes, okay? But we're gonna help you a little bit with that. Uh, the grading scheme would be uh, absolute grading. So there won't be any curving or anything. Um, so you have to get 97 or more to get A plus. Uh, above 92 will be A. 88% uh, or higher would be A minus. So anything above 88, you get some form of A. And the rest, you're gonna see it in this slide. Uh, typically, historically in this class, most people get some form of A, uh, overwhelmingly, I mean, almost everybody. Uh, and, uh, and we're gonna hopefully have the same thing here, but you have to earn it, right? So you have to do all those things. Typically, if you follow all these things that I say, if you turn in your homeworks, you do your projects, you study for your, you know, quiz and don't bomb your quiz uh, and be, you know, you know, participating in the class, either in campus wire or in person, you should be expecting to get a really good grade. Okay. So that's kind of the policy. Um, we might kind of scale things up if I see that you're not doing very well, uh, but that doesn't happen. It never happens. So usually people are just doing very well uh, anyway. Okay. Uh, all right, so participation, you, as I said, you, there are two ways to earn participation, the 5%. You either come to the class, each, each class I'm gonna give you uh, kind of like a code to scan and you have to kind of check in. Uh, then I'm gonna count those and if you are more than 75, sorry, 70% 70 of the classes, excluding the quizzes, uh, you get your full 5% of participation. 
the rest it will be basically, you know, I get the ratio and then I give you zero to five based on your participation. Uh, if you're not planning to come to the class, that's totally fine. You have to be active on campus wire, okay? So you either have to ask some questions or answer some questions. Uh, you need 50 uh, uh, reputation points. Uh, if you go to campus wire, you will see your points. You know, next next to your name is like a chicken kind of, and then next to that chicken is, is, a, is a number. That's your reputation point. Everybody starts with zero, but as you answer and ask more questions, you're gonna get more points, okay? If you, your answer is endorsed by me or other people like it, uh, you're going to get more points. And usually for getting 50, you need to kind of answer a few questions in the entire quarter. So you should be doing fine. Another thing that people do is kind of spamming the process and then asking some random question and the other person kind of answering that random question and they get the points. I tend to usually remove those and it's suspiciously happened in the end of the quarter. Uh, but uh, but uh, but try not to do that. Try to genuinely, you know, get participation. Again, all of these things that I do is mostly for you to learn. Uh, I'm not here to kind of like tell you to uh, you have to study and so on and so forth. This is for you to kind of learn. This is the best experience that you're gonna have, the best opportunity you're gonna have to learn something new. So I'm hoping that you kind of like you know you know use this opportunity to actually learn. So. These are all for helping you rather than kind of like I try to enforce things and kind of forcing you to do this. All right. Uh, yeah. Uh, so the format for the participation would be something like this. You're going to scan this. I'm going to tell you the, 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 the password and you're going to, you're going to, you're going to, uh, you're going to basically log in. So for example, I'll tell you to, to write welcome. Uh, if you want to try it. today, it doesn't count. But if you want to try to see if it works, you can you can do it now. Uh, one thing that is very important is please use the same format for your first and last name because I'm going to use a script to kind of find that and then count that. And then what happens is that sometimes people use lowercase, sometimes people use uppercase, sometimes they use comma, don't use comma, whatever you do, just do it consistently. I don't care what you do. Like you use like just your first name or whatever. Just use it consistently throughout the course and you will be fine, okay? Does the link work for everybody? Okay. Yeah, so today doesn't count, but I mean, if you want to. All right, so to kind of summarize, there are three components that you need to be you know, paying attention to. There's the course website, which is basically available online. There's no like, you know, login, uh, firewall. Uh, the link for this is, is our website. And then if you go to the courses and there are different courses, you have to go to this one and then you will see that. There are three different tabs. There is like the homepage. Most of the things are in that kind of like the lecture, the schedule thing, okay? So all the lectures, videos, assignments, projects, there will be posted there, okay? Then there is Campus Wire, which we will be used for announcements and Q&A and discussions and DMing. And then there will be great scope for submitting the assignments and for grading the assignments. So these are the three components. We're not gonna, as I said, we're not gonna use Cam Canvas slash Bruin Learn or anything else. Are we clear? There are some more seats here in the in the in the front if you guys just all right. So waitlist. Uh I think yesterday there were like six. Now I saw there are 16 people on the waitlist. Uh the, the physical class size is 256 in this classroom. So we're gonna have that that number. I'm open to add a few more. Because we're not, we're not gonna have like we're gonna have online class and kind of like in-person class, but that means that you know during the quiz we're not gonna have enough seat for everybody. So some people have to kind of sit in various random places. Uh, in order to uh, to to get that PTE, you have to request the link that I'm gonna show you in the next slide. But it's going to be case by case, and I'm not gonna give more lots of PTEs because the class is already full. Okay, unfortunately we cannot. I and mean, actually it was a very hectic process this year because we started with like 150-ish classroom. They found another classroom and so on and so forth. 
I, I got more than 100 emails with just the title PTE this year. Uh, so it was, yeah, it was a tough, tough experience for me. And I'm sure it was, it was very hectic for you guys. But uh, for those of you who need PTE, just know that it would be hard. Uh, I'm going to, uh, so use this link to kind of like submit your P. This is a Google form. Submit your request for PT for those of you who needs it. Uh, I'm going to go through it case by case and then assign PTEs for those of you who need PTE. Uh, but if you didn't uh, satisfy a requirement, so if you didn't take CS33 or M16 or M51, I'm not going to give you PTE, okay? For, for that reason, you're not going to get a PTE. But if you're a grad student or someone who is graduating like this quarter or next quarter and couldn't get in, uh, I'll consider the request, okay? Especially for grad students because they couldn't take the class regularly. Uh, so I might give some PTs to grad students, all right? Let me see. Uh, those who are on the wait list, you're gonna get into the class. Unless, except the very last person who is, <laughs> because we are 241, okay? So that last person, I'll probably get the PT to that person too, but it won't be automatic. So the first one to 15 gonna get in automatically, okay? <laughs> Whoever is the 16, please come to, to the, you know, introduce yourself so other people know you how unlucky you are. But anyway. Uh, so discussion sessions, all right? So this is important. So we're gonna use a different format for discussion session. You probably seen this for other classes too, because generally UCLA decided to kind of let go of discussion sessions entirely. Uh, the way we're gonna do it is that we're gonna post a recorded video of what the TA would have said in the regular discussion session. You're gonna watch that video. We're probably gonna post either one or two videos each week. The videos will be like some practice examples, some discussion of what we discuss in the class and so on and so forth. So this is, will be done by the TAs, not by me, okay? Uh, so probably two different TAs gonna post videos. You're gonna watch that on your free time. Uh, we hopefully will post this on either Thursday or Friday morning. So right after the two classes that we have on Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, then we're gonna hold office hours that you can go to the you know, to the TA's office and they can, you can ask questions, okay? Uh, the, the office hours will be on Monday and Friday afternoon. We're gonna post the exact time and location and everything soon. Uh, and, and you can then just go there and ask your questions. If neither of these two times work, you can, as I said, you can either come to my you know, office hours, which is on Thursdays, or you can always email the TAs and ask for some other time, okay? So the office hours is basically is for you to kind of go and if you have any questions, you can you can ask there, okay? If you have to have a one-on-one -on -one session with your TAs, if you didn't understand topics properly or if you have further questions, anything like that, the TAs will be there. Uh, the default will be two hours, but uh, if you need more time, we will assign more TA hours, okay? So don't worry if you didn't get time. Let me know and we can, we can adjust, okay? So it's probably, it's usually kind of like, it's a, it's, it's, it's a adaptive kind of workload. So it's kind of starts small and then go big when we are close to the quiz or close to the deadline of the project. So we're gonna assign like ad hoc uh, additional slots for the TA office hours if you need be, okay? And then of course you can always post your question on Campus Wire uh, as you watch the video of the lecture or the video of the TAs, just ask your question on Campus Wire and somebody very quickly will gonna answer that as well. Okay, so so discussion session that you're in, forget about them. So consider that not part of your kind of schedule. You can watch them whenever you want, and then you can just attend the office hour whenever you want. Again, you don't have to attend the Friday one or the Monday one. You can attend either of them, okay? Sounds good? All right, so the few of you on the honors section, those of you who don't know what honors section is, is that EC department has this additional thing called honors uh, that you take an additional two or one hour credits and you do more for different courses. Uh, those of you who are on the honors section, I think the class will be on Thursdays. There won't be class this week. There won't be anything next week either. So our first class will be two weeks from now, okay? Uh, what we're going to do in the honor section is uh, we're going to use a different project. 
the project will be about implementing the same thing that we are implementing in the class, but on Verilog on NFPGA. So I'm going to actually implement it on Verilog and PGA. The, pro the, the, the design will be a, a little bit more complex. So we're going to actually design an out of order processor on FPGA, not the regular in order one that we're going to do in the class. Uh, so, and then you don't need to do the regular project class. You're just going to do that. Okay. For other people who wants to get into the honor section, uh, I recommend to do it if you want to do something on Verilog and hardware implementation, okay? Uh, anybody are welcome to come to the honor section and do the project if you want, okay? But you need to have a hardware related background. If you don't have it, just don't forget it, okay? Uh, textbook, we're gonna have uh, the computer organization textbook in this class, uh, the RISC V edition, that's important because there is MIPS edition, there is ARM edition, and there is RISC V edition. This is optional. I'm going to assign readings for this, but the readings are just optional. It's not like something that we're going to ask. Uh, there are online versions of this is available as well if you want to read it. Uh, and we won't cover all the chapters. Actually, at some point, we're going to completely diverge from the book. Okay. But from the initial part, the book is helpful. Question. The question is, are the reading material would be on the quizzes? No, it won't. So it's, so the quiz, you know, the book is kind of overlapping. The parts that I'm going to assign, I already covered it in the class. But for your quizzes, just the lectures is enough. <clears throat> How many of you have used Zybook? Have you heard about Zybook or used Zybook in other classes? OK. Did you like? How many of you, those of you used it, you didn't like it? No, no, okay. Good feedback. All right, any any other questions about the logistics? Logistics. Are we clear about everything? All right, let me see. All right, so I'm gonna also do this and then I'm gonna give you a break and then we can come back. Uh, the last question that most of you have is why am I taking this course? Because I have no interest in hardware. Yeah, question. Are the quizzes open no? Open, open. Yes. So the question is, are the quizzes open no? So the quizzes are open everything. So you can bring your laptop or book. I've seen people watch the lectures during the... <laughs> uh, seriously, yeah. Uh, so you're gonna laugh, but but I'm gonna I'm gonna show you that people are gonna do that. Uh, but you won't have so the quizzes are are designed to be kind of cramped. So it's like you have to be quick, and especially the first one, people are kind of not like it because of that. But be prepared. So it's gonna be open note, but you you will have lots of things to write as well. Okay. The only thing is not allowed is using chat GP3, right? Uh, so, and generally you cannot create content. So you cannot generate new content, but you can Google or you can, for example, search in the internet. If somebody has answered that question, great. Uh, you can just write it down, uh, but you cannot ask yourself. Like, you cannot like post a new question in any of these websites or you cannot ask any of these gen AIs to, to answer a question for you, okay? Uh, but other than that, you're free, you're free to use anything, okay? And then, of course, you're not allowed to talk to each other, uh, neither over chat or just in person. Yeah. Uh, so the question is that I noticed that there are three quizzes. Does that include the final or not? There won't be any final. There will be just three quizzes. Any other questions? Yeah. So the question is that are the quizzes cumulative? No. So we're going to do like from lecture one to lecture seven or eight would be quiz one. From lecture nine to lecture like 14, 15 would be quiz two. And the rest would be quiz three. Any other questions? All right. So going back to this, that the reason that we are here, right? So I, you know, most of you have to take this course. If it was like optional, probably you wouldn't take it. But I'm going to make a case that this is actually quite useful for you. Even you're into like, I don't know, machine learning, software engineering, CI, CD, whatever. Uh, 
the reason for this is that every computer scientist or engineer needs to kind of know what's going on underneath, okay? And this computer architecture course is actually a very, very good course to kind of give you a high level understanding of what's going on underneath your software abstraction, okay? Uh, one thing I'm particularly proud of is that during our kind of uh, la you know, the end of the quarter kind of feedback, people are really uninterested about the course at the beginning, and then it's going to go to the right, like they're becoming very interested in the course. And the reason for that is they're going to talk about interesting things that is happening underneath, and you're going to see the connection between your software design all the way to the hardware, okay? So this interaction is actually quite useful, and you're going to learn a lot of things about that. Uh, so we're going to actually talk about what are the trends, what are the metrics, where are we heading and where are we coming from? So I'm going to tell it kind of like a story for you guys of like what is happening every year until we are here. Okay. And we're going to also talk about the limitations and why we have these limitations. Uh, so as a pure computer scientist, software engineer, no interest to hardware at all, you're actually going to get something useful out of this course, which is going to be very useful for you in the, your career. Uh, to give you an, a, an insight of why this would be useful, let's actually look into ChatGPT, right? So why do you think we didn't invent ChatGPT like 20 years ago? Any, any suggestions? Like why we don't have, why all of a sudden now is the time for us to kind of have something like a, this big gen AI model? Yeah. Computation power. Computation power, okay. And any other suggestion? We have more data. We have more data, okay. Anything else? Maybe some scientist was clever enough to design the, you know, the, the algorithm, right? So there are actually three things that's kind of like creates this magic of machine learning that we have these days. There are kind of three pillars. One is the computation power, the hardware that we have. The other is the large data sets that we are getting, right? The data that we have. And of course there is algorithms. There's like lots of these machine learning, you know, scientists and, and designers that keep thinking about, oh, what if I do this? And what if I add that? And so on and so forth. But the surprising thing that why we didn't get something like chat GPT 20 years ago is that the algorithms about like, you know, neural networks was actually, most of them are not new. Many of them has been proposed in 70s and 80s. Okay, the concept of neural network was, was proposed many, many years ago, but it took 40 years-ish to get where we are now, okay? So in terms of algorithms, things didn't really happen magically. One thing that kind of happened magically was the data sets. But the data sets actually happens in the early 2000s, like Pascal or, or, or C4. These are all data sets that we created in early 2000, okay? But one thing that all of a sudden happened was we managed to build this, this massive thing called GPUs, okay? And we built this very, very sophisticated GPUs. And this was actually the reason that we now can run this very, very sophisticated models. 10 years ago, we couldn't run ChatGPT because we didn't have enough computational power to run it, okay? It would have taken months for, for training something. It would have taken days to actually get an inference out of this. But now we can do it. Uh, and that's the magic of designing a new hardware. That's the magic of the computer architecture. And we're going to talk about why and how we got to this point that we are. And we're going to also talk about how we're going to like, you know, even make it even better. Okay. So how are we going to actually improve this? Uh, to give you a little bit of number, this is by the way from Bill Daly, who's uh, VP of NVIDIA. Uh, uh, so this is actually NVIDIA's kind of like GP mod, the size model. So this is uh, petaflops per second over training days. If I want to train a big model, how long does it take, okay? So in 2012, that was like kind of like the, the birth of deep learning methods like AlexNet. It was kind of like, you know, lower. And then through the fourth year, like, you know, in four years, we kind of like start from AlexNet, go to the rest. By the way, if you don't know anything about machine learning, don't worry, this is just different algorithms. Uh, we, we got into uh, much bigger. Then we have this big jump when we start moving to transformers and generative models. And that's where we are now with GP3 and then GPT4 is actually even higher. And there are like, you know, reports that GPT5 will be somewhere here. 
So we're going to need a lot of you know, computational power to do these models. We're talking about billions and billions of parameters, billions of operations of addition and multiplication. Okay? So we need more hardware to do that. And unfortunately, now is the hardware is the bottleneck. And once we solve that bottleneck, we can actually go higher and higher. We're already doing it, as I'm saying, that you know we were here and now we are here and we're gonna go higher than this. We're actually gonna, uh, assuming that we're gonna do that. So how do we did, it, did this is the story of this course, okay? How do we start from the inference time of, uh, you know, Terra ops of, of what, G, you know, NVIDIA, the first, you know, version of NVIDIA had in uh, the, the Kepler, all the way to the, the brand new A100 GPU that we have these days in 2020, uh, you see around 317X, 300, 300 times improvement in the speed of inference of one single round of machine learning task in just eight years, okay? So that's a significant improvement. And that's the kind of the magic of the things that we did in computer architecture, okay? So we're gonna talk about this. And you can see that how this is relevant to a designer at the higher level as well, because once they understand this kind of interaction, they can design a better software. They can, they can design a better algorithms. If they understand that there is the hardware interaction that can, they can be leveraged, okay? Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna learn about this. And what I want to say is learning about this is important, impactful, and actually quite useful for your careers. And these days, being just a software developer may not cut it, okay, to, to get a job. You need to understand the systems. You need to understand a little bit lower than that, okay? So for you guys that you have time, I definitely recommend you to kind of expand your knowledge, add a little bit of depth to your knowledge, okay? So still you want to focus as whatever you are, a machine learning data scientist, uh, software engineer, uh, but you want to add depth to your career, to your resume, and this is kind of where you can get that depth. Okay. Uh, so let's have a break here. If is there any question? All right. So let's have five minute break. Let's be back at twelve fifty five. All right. So let's continue. Um. So what we're gonna learn in this class step by step. We're gonna first start talking about what we call instruction set architecture. This is basically the first layer of connection between software to hardware, okay? Uh, we call this ISA. And then this risk five thing is actually an ISA, okay? So we're gonna start with that. Uh, you probably know what ISA is in CS33. So we're gonna discuss that quickly and then go over more serious stuff. Uh, the second thing is that, okay, now that we have an ISA, how do we implement this ISA? Like what is the actual hardware that gonna like you, the ISA is basically just a, a table, think about, it, okay? How do we actually translate this table into an actual hardware? And then when, when that's where the story of macro architecture begins, okay? We're gonna talk about this in week two, three, and so on and so forth, all right? Then we're gonna say, okay, we design kind of like a bare bone macro architecture. How do we optimize this? So we're gonna talk a lot about techniques that we're gonna use. We're gonna talk about things like pipelining, speculation, parallelism, and things like that. Uh, and these are the kind of the, the biggest part of the computer architecture. And the funny thing about this is uh, these techniques is actually, you're using it in many, many other systems and in your everyday life as well, like parallelism, pipelining, uh, uh, speculation, uh, you know, optimizing for common case, things like that is actually things that we do in everyday life. So it's actually the nice thing about, you know, computer architecture system courses, give you a system level, uh, you know, thinking as well. It's not, it's not just about the hardware. It's actually through these examples, you'll see a more of a generic way of optimizing things, okay? Lastly, we're gonna talk about memory hierarchy. We're gonna talk about caches. We're gonna talk about main memory and then the big part on that side. Uh, and then the last few weeks of the class, basically your quiz three will be about multi-core systems, basically mainly about consistency and coherency. Uh, in the last week of class, I'm going to also talk about GPU. So I'm going to come back to the slides that I showed you. And gonna, once you have all this information that you got from the course, now we're going to actually kind of open the, the GPU up and then we're going to discuss that. But we're not going to go through the very details. It's just going to be like a very kind of like basic level of GPUs, okay? 
uh, hopefully by the end of this course, you can understand what this is. And when, you know, the next generation of iPhone comes out and they say, oh, this is the best processor ever and so on and so forth. And then now we added like a four wide piece CPU. We have like a low performance and high performance core and we have fabric and we have, you know, MPUs. What are these and why they matter? Okay. So by the end of this course, you will fully understand all of these things. Okay. And you will understand that it's interesting, but it's not that big of a deal as they say. All right. So any final questions before we kind of go jump into the, the first topic? Cool. So the very first question is how do we, how do computers work? Okay. Like how do we actually run things? And, uh, and then the way it works is is that it's a very very complex things many many different layers. You as your computer engineer, electrical engineer, computer scientist, you're taking very very different courses, different layers of abstraction. So the trick that you're using in when you're designing computers is you're taking it as a big box that just runs program, right? And then we kind of see it as as kind of a box with multiple layers, okay? And we call this uh, abstraction layers, okay? So there is uh, a software abstraction layer, uh, the hardware abstraction layer, the operating system abstraction layer, and so on and so forth. And what we do is that when we are focusing on one abstraction layer, we kind of think about other things as, as the box. So we kind of say that, okay, this is the box, this is the program, and this is the output, right? Then we say that, okay, now let's actually break this box into maybe the operating system and another box which is the hardware. And then this is basically what you do in your like operating system course in 111F, right? So you say, okay, this is the operating system, let's focus on this. You don't care about the software, you don't take care about the programming language, you don't care about compiler, you don't care about hardware. Then you go to another course and say, okay, let's focus on comp compiler design and just that kind of very, very narrow part of the, of the design. So the trick is that we're gonna kind of like break these things down into smaller part and then and kind of go there. And this is the trick that we're gonna use in this course as well. So we're gonna basically go all the way into this hardware part of it. This is the abstraction that you probably haven't looked before. So we're gonna break that down and we're gonna talk about that, okay? Uh, so the main benefit of this is that you don't necessarily need to be a full hardware designer to understand how your software work. You don't need to be a, like an expert in software to understand how your hardware works. It's just all about contracts. It's all about protocols that we follow in order to make sure that the entire system works correctly. Okay? So, so this is kind of like the very simplified way of thinking about computers, okay? We have the application layer as kind of the outer layer. We have the system software or operating system as kind of middle layer. And then we have the hardware in the middle, okay? So these are the three things that we need to understand. And here we're gonna talk about this hardware part and we're gonna talk about the interaction between hardware and the interaction between software, okay? But we're not gonna go full into hardware. We're gonna think about like more high level hardware. We're not gonna talk about transistors and how they work. We're gonna talk about components together doing something. Like we're gonna talk about, okay, this is an adder that adds to number. I'm not gonna care how this adder is implemented. This is something that you probably learned in M16 or M51. Uh, or maybe not, uh, but, but, but what we're gonna talk about is that if I have these components, how do I combine these components to make something more, okay? And that more is like basically, how do I run the instructions, okay? Uh, so basically to kind of give you a little bit more, we start from algorithms, codes. This is in some high level language like C, Java, Python, so on and so forth. At the system software level, we have two main parts, the compiler and the operating system. Uh, that does lots of things like, you know, handling the inputs, outputs, managing the memory, scheduling the task and so on. And yeah, the hardware level is where we're going to focus is the processor and memory and the IO control. Okay. Uh, if you're interested in like abstraction layers, these are like some fun videos you can, you can watch. Again, it's completely optional. Uh, another thing that you want to want to know about is the theoretical perspective of how computers work. So I just gave you a very, very practical version of how computer works. But there's also a theory of computation and history of computers also very, very interesting to, to, to know about. Like what is a Turing machine? What do we call a computer? And what's a Turing complete and so on and so forth. Uh, so if you want to kind of, again, get a like high level idea of these things, these are good videos to watch. Again, completely optional. Uh, but what we're gonna focus on is kind of like a C 
something like this, right? So we're gonna start with the high level language. We're gonna somehow compile it. I don't know how, and we're not gonna talk about it. We're gonna actually talk about how we can improve the compiler based on the hardware a little bit later in the course. But we're gonna get what we call like an assembly language, a sequence of instructions, okay? This sequence of instructions is based on a particular language which we call IFA. Okay, so we're first gonna learn that language a little bit. Uh, we're gonna talk about RISC-V particularly, but then we're gonna see that how this language becomes this binary machine, this zeros and ones, and how hardware understand this seemingly kind of, you know, meaningless thing and doing something relevant. Like how do we actually know that this is an add or this is a multiply and so on and so forth. So the first half of the class is about Understanding this and implementing this, the second half of the class is more of how do we optimize this, okay? Uh, so if you think about the, the running the application, uh, the same kind of like abstraction layer I gave you. So you have your application kind of on the top side, you have your system software on the middle layer, and then you have your hardware, right? So this is your hardware, you have your memory, CPU and IO, these are the main three things that you're gonna have. And then the biggest problem you're gonna have is, you're going to write your programs completely unaware of what is your underlying hardware, right? Whenever you write a code, you don't know where, which hardware this is going to be running, right? Some of them might be in Apple Silicon, some of them might be in ARM, some of them is Intel x86, some of them are AMD. Each one is completely different designs, completely different languages. So how on earth are programs are actually run on these things? Well, how come we can actually write our own program in C without being worried that the, the underlying hardware is gonna change. Because in that case, you have to have to change your language or change your style for every single hardware. And that would be a big headache, okay? So we're gonna have different languages and different implementation. And, and we have this problem of, okay, how do we fix this? And we kind of like fix this at the kind of the middle layer, okay? The magic kind of happens at the middle layer, the way that we're gonna kind of implement this. Uh, and that is where we're gonna have this compatibility fix. We're, compatib we're gonna fix this compatibility issue with what we call the instruction set architecture, okay? ISA. So what is an ISA? So think about three players, right? So the hardware, the software, and the system software. The hardware guy is kind of old and, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, not very kind of modern person. And then the software is this cool guy. Uh, and the system software is kind of the person that's kind of like moderate between these two. So we're going to have this contract and this is a very important contract we're going to have. The software is going to accept that the program they're going to write will translate into sequence of things we call instructions, okay? So whatever I write, should be translated into a sequence of instructions, okay? So I need some support for that. Uh, and that's where the compiler comes into play. And the hardware gonna also accept that no matter what I do in the underlying hardware, how do I implement this? I'm going to be able to support all of these instructions, okay? So if, I, if I'm a new company and then I'm designing a new hardware, I can do whatever I want in my hardware, but what I need to do is that if I, for example, supporting ARM, I should support all the instructions in the ARM ISA, okay? So if I do that, how do I implement it doesn't matter, okay? So that's basically where this magic happens, that you, you can implement things differently, but at the end of the day, as long as you understand that language and you can implement that language, nobody cares how you do it, okay? Uh, so we call this ISA, Instruction Set Ar Architecture. It's the interface between the hardware and software, right? It's the moments that things from software becomes hardware. Uh, the important thing about this is that this allows the things to be decoupled, okay? The software part can kind of improve in its own, with its own languages. You can have Rust, you can have Python, you can have C. They all will be translated into lists of instructions. And the hardware side can also be improved independently. You can add any features, improvement that you want. You can add branch predictors, you can add caches. We're gonna talk about all of these things. But as long as I'm supporting those lists of instructions, I'm good to go, okay? So that's the important part of these two things. And then what we're gonna see in the software side is basically a functional description of the hardware. So we're not gonna know exactly how the hardware is implemented, but we know addresses. We're gonna understand where are the storage and where are the storage locations. 
And we also understand the operation. So we know what is add and what is multiply and what is divide and so on and so forth. We don't know anything else when we are at the software layer, okay? Just these two things. I know where things are stored. I know what operations each one does. That's all. On the software, on the hardware side, all we need to know is lists of instructions and their orders. That's all I need to know. The rest is going to be taking care of what, what we call a micro architecture. Okay. So the software needs to kind of transfer this knowledge to the list of instructions and their order. And that's it. The hardware will take care of the rest. And the software just needs to understand the addresses and needs to understand the, the operations. Okay. These are the two things that they need. Okay. Any questions? So in this course, we're going to focus on RISC V. Next, next week, I'm going to talk about RISC V architecture. Uh, first of all, it's, 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 it's not RISC V, it's, uh, it's, it's pronounced RISC V. The reason that it's RISC V is the fifth version of the RISC architecture, which was designed originally in Berkeley. Uh, why are we using RISC V? Is because RISC V is what we call an open source ISA, which means that if you design a processor on RISC V, you don't need to pay royalty to anybody. Uh, if you use ARM, you need to actually pay royalty to ARM because the ARM ISA is not open source, okay? Or it's same thing for x86 or same thing for Apple and so on and so forth. Apple is actually based on ARM anyway. Uh, but RISC-V is actually very educational in terms of being open source. But these days actually RISC-V is getting even more into the industry. So in future, like, you know, 10, 20 years from now, most likely many, many of the systems will be RISC-V based. So it's very useful to know that. But in principle, there's not significant difference between RISC-V and ARM and MIPS and so on and so forth, really. Okay, so the principles are the same. The details are slightly different, okay? So we're gonna talk about this in the next few lectures about the RISC-V ISA, okay? Uh, but before jumping into how do we design the architecture, it's important to see what is the goal. Okay, what, what are we trying to do when we are designing hardware? So let's say you are in the hardware design. What should you do in the designing of hardware? What is a good hardware design? Any suggestion? What is the metric that you are going to go after? Yeah. To be fast. To be fast. Anything else? Yeah. Scalability. Scalability, okay. Yeah. Reliability. Reliability. Any, yeah. Um, like lower, power consumption. lower power consumption. Okay. Yeah. Inexpensive. Inexpensive. The cost. Sure. Any other final suggestion? Yeah. Increasing performance. performance. Increasing performance. Yeah. Yeah. So like accessibility. So like ability to do everything that the software wants you to do. Accessibility. You Expressibility. Said. Expressibility. So that we can do anything we want the software wants. Yeah. Okay. Security. Security. That's good. Bonus point for you. <laughs> all right. So the first thing that you want to do, yeah, all of these things are important. Uh, there is an order for these things as well. Okay. So the, the, if I want to say one thing, I would say efficient. I want to design efficient computers. Okay. And now the, the another question is, okay, what is efficient? Uh, the most important thing that we call efficient is fast. We want computers to be fast, okay? And that's been the main reason of designing and main driver of designing computers for the last 30, 40 years, okay? We just want faster computers. That's all we really care, okay? And then if you think about when the Intel or AMD or Apple design their new the, the system, the first thing they're gonna say is that this computer, this design is like 20%, 30% faster than the previous. That's the first thing all of them say, okay? Because that's the first thing all of us care about. We want faster computer, okay? But fast is not just enough because now we are kind of changing things a little bit, okay? Now we have watches and now we have mobiles, cell phones, battery power devices. So we also care about power consumption because if I have things that are really fast, but my cell phone battery kind of discharged in one hour, nobody's going to buy that. They're going to buy something that is slower, but they have like 12 hours battery, okay? So you want fast and power efficient, okay? And sometimes these two are not the same thing. Sometimes you need less fast things, but more power efficient. So we're going to talk about what's the difference between these two. What is the trade-off between these two, 
But in addition to that, I also care about costs. And when I'm talking about costs, I'm talking about area, I'm talking about reliability, I'm talking about fault tolerance and all those things. So I, I care about costs as another factor in designing the computer. And, and of course, I need things that are secure. And the interesting thing about security is, it's always been kind of the secondary issue. Uh, last 30 years or so, security always been, okay, we want to build computers and we're gonna talk about the security thing later, okay? And what is the result? The result is that our computers these days are not designed for security. And the problem is it's really hard to fix security as this kind of after the fact, okay? So what is happening is that all of our systems are becoming attacked very easily. Like you see news every day. Uh, recent one is like, you know, MGMs, you know, being being hacked and so on and so forth. Most of them is because we didn't consider security as a, as a main metric. We always thought about it as kind of, oh, can I add this and that afterwards and see if it works? And the answer is no, okay? The answer is you cannot do that. And, and now you have to go back and design for security. Uh, we're not going to talk much about security in this course, but that's kind of like an announcement and advertisement for my other course. Okay, <laughs> but 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 this is important to know that you know security is a very important part of of this. But in this order, the performance is number one. Okay, so performance is ninety nine percent important, and the rest is like one percent. Uh, power is getting more because of you know mobile devices, but still performance is the number one. Okay, it's the it's the money uh, in in design. Okay, all right. So let's talk about this performance and let's see how far we have come. Like what happens in this past few years, uh, because this will help us to understand the rest of this class. Okay, why we're going to talk about things that we are talking about. Okay, so I'm going to give you a little bit of like history lecture and the rest of this lecture today. And, and then next week, we're gonna actually start talking about the actual implementation, all right? So this is where we start, okay? This is uh, ENIAC. This is what we designed in 1945. This is considered the first general purpose computer, okay? It was bigger than this room. And, and the power of that computer was significantly smaller than the Apple Watch that you have now on your wrist, okay? So that's the difference. That's uh, significant you know engineering that we done from 1945 to 2023 okay um this is another one vax this is, was kind of like the first kind of pc uh this is in 70s by ibm and this is also like a big kind of like like as big as this a little bit smaller than this okay uh there are also others if you actually search in wikipedia or watch that video uh that i shared uh the link with on YouTube, uh, you know, there, there are other machines in 70s that's kind of like the general purpose, okay? So this is where we started. Uh, and this is the, the trend, okay? So this is the picture that I'm gonna come back to multiple times in this lecture. Uh, so if we kind of put the 78 as kind of like the first general purpose computer, and if we kind of like look into uh, the X, the Y axis is the performance and the X axis is time. If we start from 1978 to 2018, which is this one is the Intel Core i7, you know, I don't know, eight generation, whatever from, from Intel. You see that, uh, you see that it's about 50,000 times faster, okay? 50,000 times faster starting from 78 to 2018, okay? Uh, and then if you look at this is, uh, 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 is, is there are kind of five distinct eras, okay? Uh, the first era was this time that we kind of improved the performance of computers by 25% per year, okay? Uh, this is, this second part is we, we doubled that. So we did 52 times, 52% per year. And then we kind of slow it down to 23, 12, and now we're kind of at 3.5. So let me talk about these different eras and talk to you what is the difference between why we had this improvement in these different eras, okay? Uh, before that, let me also show you another graph. And this is the how fast the clock can be kind of uh, switched, okay? So then the, the first version of Intel processor, the 80, uh, uh, 802, 86, which were kind of the reasons that we call this x86. 
uh, the, the clock rate was around 2.5 megahertz, 12.5 megahertz. Now we have 3,400, around 3.4 gigahertz of clock. And clock is kind of give you kind of like how fast you can run things, okay? Uh, and then the second thing is the power. Uh, the power goes up kind of, but we also managed to find ways to make the power more efficient. And the interesting thing is this kind of peak here and that I'm going to talk about as well, that we kind of like go up and then manage to come down again. So we actually made some tricks to make this more power efficient. And that would be kind of the last topic that we're going to talk about in this course. Okay. So this is also good to know. Um, so yeah, so if you like you look at the first versus the last, we managed to make faster clocks by 300 times, okay? Much faster systems. Uh, and then last thing is uh, the memory storage capacity, okay? We not only managed to make computers faster, but managed to kind of be make better memories because memory is also a very, very important part of our design. First of all, you want to store more things. And also you want to have faster computers. So if you look at the storage, the amount of memory that we had at the state of the, like the most modern computer at the time, in 76, the best we could do was 16K, okay? The best, the largest memory you could have was 16K, okay? What we have these days is we have like, you know, 4G, four gigabytes of RAM and so on and so forth. Like uh, we are talking about RAM, not the, the hard drive, okay? Uh, and then this is just 2012. Now we have 32. Like if you buy a MacBook, like the default is 16 and, and then the more advanced version is 32. If you buy a server, it's like 128, something like that, right? And then the interesting thing is this, I always like very intrigued by this. So if you look at this versus this, so we started kind of building RAMs in 76, okay? It took us around more than 30 years to get to two, gigahertz, two, two gigabytes. It took us two years to double that, okay? So all the things that we did in 30 years, we managed to do it in just two years span, okay? To improve it in two years span. And we are actually doing it, that's how exponentially we kind of get more sophisticated in doing these things, okay? Same story with transistors. It took us a lot of time to build a transistor, but now we can like, put billions and billions every year. And that's very interesting, the way that we kind of evolve this technology. So this is kind of like the table that you can, you can look at it uh, in your free time. This is kind of like looking at the size, the power, performance, memory, price, and so on and so forth. But one thing that I want to kind of emphasize here is that if you look at the adjusted price for performance, that is how much do I pay to get a faster computer the interesting thing is not only we managed to build faster computers, but we managed to build cheaper computers. So the computer that we have now is faster than what we had 30 years ago, but surprisingly it's even cheaper than what we built before. So we actually get really, really efficient. And that's really interesting because you would expect that, okay, it's faster, but significantly more expensive, right? That's usually how it works. But this is this didn't happen. So we actually managed to build cheaper computers that are faster. And that's very interesting because that means that we did a really good job in engineering this, this system. Um, so what are these improvements? Okay, so let's uh, stop talking about, okay, we did a great job, yes. But how did we manage to get this? Course, okay, there are two reasons, okay? The short answer. There are new technologies and there are in innovative techniques, okay? The new technology means that we managed to use better materials, we managed to build better transistors and so on and so forth. Uh, and this is more on the lower level, like you know, device level, materials level. Uh, but we also use innovative techniques, uh, computer architecture techniques. And this is the part that we're gonna talk about uh, more in this course. Like what are those innovative techniques, all right? Uh, so I'm going to quickly talk about the first, uh, and this is the last time we're going to talk about this, and then we're going to focus on the second. So this is basically the technologies we use these days. So we start with vacuum tubes, and the relative performance for cost for that was one, if you normalize that. Now in 2013, for example, we have the ultra-large scale ICs, which the number is, you know, orders and orders of magnitude more higher. This is mainly means that Oh, I can build much, much faster systems by just changing the technology, 
Okay, and this is the technology that we're using. This is the CMOS technology that we are using, and we can pack more transistors. Okay, uh, in fact, actually, we can. We, there is this very famous law uh, called Moore's law, which was this guy called Lord of Moore, who was part of kind of founders of Intel. That uh, in in early days, he said that uh, every two years we're going to have uh, double the number of transistors in an IC. Okay. So that was his prediction in in very late, you know, in in seventies. And interestingly, if you look at the the actual industry from two from from seventies, early seventies to all the way to two thousand sixteen, you see that we roughly actually follow that same prediction. So we roughly managed to double the number of transistors in a chip every two years. Okay, which is very interesting kind of like a trend. Uh, but interesting about the the Moore's law is more of a more of about the economy. Okay, the reason for this is that it basically saying that we can manage to build cheaper transistors to get more performance every two years. Okay, uh, what it happens is that I'm going to show you how, but it basically says that the cost per transistor is kind of shrink as we go to a higher level and higher level, and that's how we manage to build. Faster transistors, faster computers, but cheaper computers. Because essentially, since we double the number, but we reduce the cost, if you look at this, it means that we actually managed to build cheaper transistors. So per transistor cost actually shrinks, okay? Uh, so what are the impacts? So why do we care about Moore's law and why it's important for us? Uh, so, and generally, why should I care that the number of transistors doubles? So like, who cares? Um, and how does this scaling actually work? So like, what, what is the impact? If I just put more transistors in the chip, what would happen to the rest of the system? What would happen to the power and area and so on and so forth? Okay, so let's actually go to this. And this is based on what we call it another law or, or rule called Denner scaling law, okay? So according to Moore's law, the number of transistors on chip doubles every year, okay? So, so if you think about this, means that the, the, the size of the transistors are shrink by 50%, right? Because uh, essentially what we do is that if you think about the transistor as kind of something like this, uh, I'm just showing it 2D. This is where we actually say, this is the size of transistor. This is the length of the channel, okay? We call this L, okay? So uh, this L is kind of, if we want to have double the number of transistors in the same area, it means that each transistor is shrinked by 50%. Like the size goes down by 50%, okay? Uh, so what happens with this? And then of course, if we think about this as a 2D, it means that the dimension is, is reduced by, 70, by 0 0.7, okay? Uh, so how this is happening, all right? So if you look at the impact of the noise scaling, there are three things that we need to care about. Four things, sorry. There is the L, the, the, the channel length, uh, 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 there is the delay, there is the frequency, there is the capacitance, and there is voltage, okay? So let me show you the numbers of how this, these other things are changing. So first of all, the voltage is reduced by around 30% or 0.7x. How? Uh, this is based on this, uh, this formula. By the way, this is the last time you're going to see a formula in this class, okay? Uh, so... Voltage is equal to the uh, the strength of your your the e the electric you know field uh, uh, strength times the, the length of your channel. Okay, that's how we actually find the voltage. If you if you don't know how, this is a physics course you probably have taken a long time ago. But you know generally just just accept it from me that voltage is depending on the the strength of your electric field and the length of your channel. Okay, so I already told you that I reduced this. Uh, uh, by a, by a factor of uh, by a factor of you know of zero point zero point five. Okay, so in order to keep the electric field constant, because that's what I care when I'm designing a transistor, I need to make this uh, zero point seven. Okay, uh, another thing that happens is now that you know the the voltage is reduced by thirty percent. Uh, and then the length is kind of stays the same. The, the length is are kind of reduced then my, my delay is also reduced by the same factor, okay? So I have lower voltage, but I also have smaller uh, uh, lengths to kind of cover. 
As a result, so I'm going to have faster transistors. So I'm going to I'm going to have uh, I'm, I'm going to need a much much faster uh, transistors because the length is is reduced. Yeah, question. I have a question about the boost one. Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel like operating voltages for the CPUs have been roughly the same around 1.3 and 1.4 for the past 10 years. Mm -hmm. And like modern CPUs are even going up in terms of so the question is that uh, uh, I, they have observed that the, the voltage of transistors is stay the same around 1.1, 1.2, and it seems that they're actually going up. So I'm talking about the previous generations. So we usually start with like 3.35, and then we go 0 0.7, 0 0.7 each time, okay? Uh, uh, so now that you're talking about like, Seven nanometers and three nanometers and five nanometers slightly different than what we are we are talking about for denser scaling. The reason for that is your channel is not really going down. Uh, it's 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 kind of like staying the same from one generation to another generation, but that's a different story. I'll I'll, I'll explain it how it works because your channel is no longer like a linear. It's kind of like this. Uh, but I'll talk about that. How how does I'll, I'll talk about that offline with you. Because that makes people confused. But generally, what I'm saying is that in regular 2D transistor, if this and this is kind of like reducing by 0 0.5, and the entire thing is kind of reducing by a factor of seven, if I want to make this channel constant, then I have to reduce the voltage by this 0 0.7. Okay, that's kind of the idea. Um, um, so my voltage goes down and that's good because now I need to put less voltage on my system. Uh, my delay also goes down. Why? Because my electric field is the same, but now I need to have like, you know, my, my, my atoms needs to kind of move a smaller amount of distance. So they're faster. That's also good. If I think about frequency, since frequency is one over time, it's the time is reduced, the frequency goes up, which means that I can, you know, switch the frequency, switch the transistor faster, uh, one over T. So if that's is reduced by 30%, my frequency is going to increase by 40%, 40%, basic math. And then my capacitance also will be reduced. The capacitance formula is some constant times the area divided by, by length. My area is divided by like, you know, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. My L is divided by five. So my capacitance is also reduced by 30%, okay? Uh, so, so just to kind of like take away from this, if you want to forget about the formulas, is that as I move from one generation of transistors to another generation of transistors, the numbers double, but then there's also other impact. My voltage reduced, okay? So I need less voltage per transistor, that's good. My delay also reduced, which means that I have now faster transistors, my frequency as a result of delay increase also increased, right? So this is also the same thing, basically. And my capacitance reduced. And the capacitance is important because the power is depending on the capacitance, okay? So looking at these, if you think about power, okay? And the formula for the power is this, is capacitance times this voltage squares time frequency. If you plug in the numbers I gave you here to here, you will see that my capacity, my, my voltage actually reduced by a factor of two. So my, my voltage will be reduced by 50%. Uh, sorry, my power will be reduced by 50%. Okay? And now if I think about the entire chip, so I have, I used to have N transistor and power of P, okay? Now I managed to have two N transistor and half of the power. So if I look at this overall power, I'll see that I get, this is the overall power Okay, uh, my overall power stays the same. Okay, so this is one, this is two. This means that OP1 and OP2 is the same. So what does this mean? It means that I managed to add more transistor to a chip from one generation to another generation. I get twice the number of transistors, but I managed to keep the power the same. Okay, so I don't need to add more power for, for kind of, you know, running the system. I keep the power constant because I managed to make my system more efficient. Not only that, I managed to increase the frequency. I managed to be able to, you know, switch things faster. So I'm going to get more transistors. 
less power and faster computers in general because I have a less delay or more frequency. Okay, this is how we actually managed to do this over this 30, 40 years. Okay, so this is the kind of like the gist of idea. Any questions? So basically what it says is that the entire chip power consumption stays the same. And that's very important because if you had to increase the power every time that we kind of increasing the, the number of transistor, at some point it will blow up. Right, so we, we couldn't do that. It wouldn't be sustainable, but now we managed to do it every single two years uh, because we managed to keep the power constant and that's very useful. Uh, so kind of to recap, I, I, I talked about the fact that we managed to make faster transistors and faster computers. We have come a long way by managing to do two things. One, the strategies and computer architecture domain that I haven't talked about yet. But we also managed to kind of like using more advanced techniques at the device level, okay? Uh, what are those techniques? The first one is we managed to use better components. We used to have vacuum tubes and so on and so forth, but now we have CMOS. And in the CMOS, we actually managed to improve it, right? We managed to put more and more transistors. And as a result, we have faster transistors, okay? But that faster transistor only come uh, you know, some amount of time, okay? So so basically, if you look at this, this 25% per year that I show in this graph, this is the result of fast returns, okay? But if you actually look into the second part, this 52% per year is faster transistor plus some additional things that we did, okay? What are those things? This is what we call the golden age of computer architecture. This is where we started doing all these caching and pipelining, and branch prediction and all those things. So in 80s and 90s, computer architecture was the was the new machine learning. Like it's kind of like everybody wanted to know about computer architecture because that was the time that was the peak of innovation in computer architecture. So the bulk of this course will be about those techniques that we're gonna have and how they translate into today's problem. Okay. But the interesting thing is <coughs> so first of all, what was the impact? The impact was if it didn't do those things, we had computers today that was 25 times slower than what we have now, okay? So that's the impact of the computer architecture at that time. So that's the important thing to know. But wait, there's more as, as well. So if you'll actually look at the kind of like the later stages, you will see that it's kind of like slowing down, okay? So it's not no longer that 52%, it's not even 25%. So it's slowing down. And as you actually see, after 2012, it's actually slowing down even more, okay? So what happens during that, that years? So in 2005, actually an important thing happened. And that was when we, 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 we say power wall. We, we hit the power wall. So what happened? So we assumed that, as I said in the formula that I showed you, that the, the power consumption was constant, okay? That if I double the number of transistors, the, the, the power consumption doesn't go up. Unfortunately, this is not, not true all the time because there is leakage, okay? In my formula, I didn't show you the leakage. And unfortunately, as I make the transistors smaller and smaller, they become so, so small that there is what we call quantum effects. That's the like transistors actually kind of like jump from one barrier to another barrier for some physics reasons that we don't care. Um, uh, so the power no longer stay constant. They actually grow up, okay? And that growth, it was so significant that at some point it was so huge that the leakage power was more significant than the actual dynamic power that we have, okay? We call that event uh, 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 hitting the power wall because we no longer can pump more power. Why we cannot pump more power? Because uh, essentially uh, the amount of, uh, the amount of power that we have was was more than what we need for, like the heat that it generates for that power was more than the, the, the rocket nozzle that we had at that time. So it was generate. So if you pump more power to your system, it creates more heat. And that heat was so significant that we couldn't cool down our system anymore, okay? So at 2005, we reached the maximum. We couldn't hit more power to our systems, right? And we needed more power because we wanted to put more transistors, okay? And they kind of hit what we call, we hit the power wall. We couldn't go beyond that. So what happened at that point? 
at that point, we kind of would come up with this clever idea. We said that, okay, why don't we, instead of making more transistor in one core, making multiple cores. And then in that case, if I look at the entire thing, it's still more transistors, but if I look at each individual one, there's still the same number of transistors, okay? So I have, if I have one, I have one chip that has one billion transistor, I don't need to make another chip that has two billion transistor. I can have two more of this one billion transistors, okay? And we call this a multi-core design. And, and then you will say, okay, this seems to be very trivial. I just add two, you know, add two chips and that's it. But now you want to have faster computation. So you want to, these two cores to be synchronized because you want to kind of divide the work and you want to kind of gather and scatter and all those things. So you still need lots of challenges in order to make this multi-core system faster, okay? Um, so we're gonna talk about this multi-core era, which we are now in basically, almost all of our systems are multi-core. And this multi-core actually was the kind of birthplace of GPUs because GPUs is the glorified multi-core system. It's a many core system, okay? So we're gonna talk about that in the later stage of the class. And then what is happening now, okay? What is happening now is that we're kind of hitting the limit of multi-core too, okay? Why are we hitting the, the limit of multi-core? Because we are facing another uh, limit. And that's what we call an Amdahl's law. This would be the final time you will see a formula in this class. And this is that what we call uh, an Amdahl's law, okay? So what is an Amdahl's law? Uh, the Amdahl's law is saying that each program has two components, okay? The part that you can parallelize and the part that you cannot parallelize, okay? So think about like moving from one house to another house, right? If there are multiple boxes, if you have many people, they can take all these boxes and take it to the new house, right? But, but the amount of boxes that you have is the maximum amount that you can parallelize. If, if there are 10 boxes, having 11 people doesn't help, right? Because there's just 10 boxes, okay? So if you look at this formula, it basically says that this P is the part that you can parallelize, so you can improve, okay? But this S, uh, and then this S is the factor of parallelization. So like five, four or eight or 12 or 26 or whatever. But there's this one minus P, the part that I cannot parallelize that's gonna limit me, okay? So if I have thousands of workers, the amount of time that somebody kind of like packing things and put the boxes there, if that part cannot be parallelized, I'm gonna be limited by that, okay? So regardless of how many cores that I have. And that's why my speed up, the, the fastest I can make this computer is gonna be limited at some point by that kind of part that I cannot parallelize, okay? So you can actually, we can, we can plug in numbers and so on. Probably TH will, will give you some examples, but let's say 20% of your program is, can be parallelizable, 80% cannot be parallelized. Sorry, the other way around. 80% can be parallelizable, 20% cannot be parallelizable. If you think about that in limits, it would be one minus 0 0.2. So at best I can do, so 0 0.8. So at best I can do 0 0.2. So at best I can make this computer faster five times. If I have all the cores in the world, this program cannot be faster more than five times, okay? And that's the limit that we are facing right now because we have all the cores, but we don't have enough algorithms, okay? So this is where we have this limit. And that limit is even worse because now we have, we are, we are, we have another problem and that is I have many cores, but I cannot turn them on at the same time because again, my power goes so high that I cannot have like, 64 cores all run at the same time. We call this dark silicon, okay? So this is uh, the uncle of, uh, uh, of the Lion King. Uh, that's that's kind of like not letting us to kind of, you know, do, do more things, okay? And this is where we kind of like the end of Moore's Law. This is where we are right now, okay? And that's kind of the end of the story. Uh, but the story doesn't end here. Uh, first of all, we're gonna talk about all these things here, but later on, I'm gonna show you how we're doing it now how we are actually making these problems go away. Uh, and that's the story of week 10, okay? Hopefully if you survive, you can see that. All right, so quick takeaways before I let you guys go. So we history, historically managed to double the performance every, every 12, 12, 24 months, every two years. The beauty of that was we keep the power same, 
uh, the micro architecture techniques that we're going to talk about in the next few weeks help us to improve that by a factor of 25. But we hit the power wall, so we had to add more cores. So we're going to talk about the story of multi cores in the second part of the class. But the multi cores is also ending. So we're going to talk about advanced features in the last week of class. All right. That's all, guys. Thanks. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.